the idea is that there's like 30 different characteristics that would come along with that cultural that like could be the seasonality, it could be... Can we, can we get started with the next session, please? Um, as, just before, uh, another announcement. As I promised you, uh, when, whenever a rule is broken, I get the... Uh, it comes to me, so please don't smoke on this campus. Uh, uh, if you do, the security guards will come after me. So, well, and I'd rather that didn't happen. Okay. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to have uh, Wendy Carlin from the uh, University of College of University College of London here to speak with us. Wendy has worked extensively on issues of uh, macroeconomics and uh, the transition economies, uh, uh, and more recently on the debates on austerity. And uh, I think it's. I'd like also to mention that she's probably the, the head of probably one of the most interesting projects that INET is involved in, which is to try to uh, uh, radically alter the undergraduate economics curriculum. Uh, the reason I bring, it, bring this up is that I know many of you are, will be or are teaching undergraduate uh, curricula, uh, undergraduate economics, and uh, if you have any interest in thinking about new ways of teaching, you should definitely speak to Wendy about this because she's been uh, spearheading this effort which has got a lot of attention across the world. Uh, today, Wendy will speak on this issue of institutions, integration and divergence, lessons from Europe. Thank okay. you, Ajit. Thanks very much. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's, 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 been it's been great fun so far. Yeah, so the interests of most people here are, are in, in development, but what we're going to talk about is some, some lessons from the European context, and I hope there'll be some connection with, with, with your own set of interests. Um, so what I'm going to do is to give some very broad descriptive data um, uh, about macroeconomic trends to three case studies from Europe, and one of these is going to come from Italy, one from Germany, and one from the Eurozone. So there's a kind of, um, a, there's a good spread. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a micro mechanism that links the interaction between uh, integration and institutions to divergence or convergence. So that's going to be a kind of little segment in the middle where you'll, you'll actually see Sam reappearing um, on the scene. And then uh, come back to some suggestive evidence from the case studies. Okay, so the sort of whet your appetite about what these questions might be, then suggest a mechanism that might help us to understand it and then come back and try and fit the cases to the mechanism. Okay, so that's, the, that's the idea. So the idea is that um, within an integrated area, and I'm going to be talking both at the regional level and at the country level, that we can think about there being two stable institutions, culture convention, and I'm going to explain more about what I mean by that. The North and the South, as in Europe. I, I gave a, a version of, a, of a talk based on on some of these ideas in Korea, and things got very difficult because the North and the South were reversed. But anyway, within within both the Italian and the European context, then uh, the North is going to turn out to be the, the high productivity convention, and the South um, the low productivity one. So just forget Korea for the, for the moment. So the idea is that. Uh, deeper integration between these areas, so this could be within a nation or it could be within another uh, institutional structure like uh, a monetary union, then what, what can happen is that if the, the cost of exiting the weaker convention, uh, uh, can, that can raise, so more integration can, work, can raise the cost of exit because you benefit from victim gains, uh, gains from trade. Okay, and that that in turn can reinforce the convention. So how do you deal with this problem if you have part of your country or part of your integrated monetary area in a low productivity set of institutional arrangements and part of it in a high productivity set of arrangements? Well, policy perhaps or some kind of big shock could uh, reduce the costs of exiting the, the sub or called the Southern Convention but you're not going to get convergence un unless you do that, unless you manage to get out. Um, most of the, the, the time I'm going to be talking about the top arrow, okay, so the idea of the, the connection from this institution's culture convention by integration to specialization in, in trade, and then at the end I'm going to come back and talk about the bottom arrow and uh, how we might think of 
the integration process re actually operating to reinforce this, uh, this structure. So we begin with Italy. This is long run data from uh, 1861 uh, showing the GDP per capita of the south, so the red part to the centre north, the, the green plus the, the white. And the, the, the economic historians, the Italian economic historians, have basically come to the view that, that there was no difference at unification between the um, GDP per capita in the two parts of the country. Okay, so there's, in, on this data series, there's uh, divergence all the way to uh, roughly the early 1950s. Then there's, there's a small period of, of convergence and then stagnation through the, the subsequent period. So you get the, the southern part of the country with GDP per capita just over half that of the north and it basically stays there over a very long period of time. The second case I want to look at is Germany. And here we're talking about the east of Germany relative to the west. And the, the data here is, the early data is from 1913. Um, these, these little diamonds here suggest that at least in this period, the, uh, the east, if anything, had higher GDP per capita than the west. Then we have the planning period here where Okay, there's a dramatic um, divergence in performance through, through that period. And then uh, what we're in some sense very interested in is when this experiment ceases and East and West Germany are reintegrated, uh, what, what, what happens? Okay, so that's the, that's the setting for Germany. Putting the Italian and German data on the same picture serves to highlight the, this incomplete but partial convergence in the German case um, uh, as compared with the, the just nothing happens um, with the Italian that's what you want Okay, that just gives you a close-up of that same picture somehow more, more dramatic comparing to the German. What about the Eurozone? So I've just kept Italy on there to give some kind of uh, sense of scale. Um, uh, what, 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 what I, I've done here is to simply divide the Eurozone into the north and the south. So the south is Italy, Spain, Greece, and Portugal. The north is Germany, um, the Benelux, the Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Austria, and Finland. And France. France and Ireland are neither north nor south. <laughs> okay, so they're excluded. If you, if, you were, if you put them in, it doesn't make, make any difference, but it seems reasonably sensible. Not quite. <laughs> okay. So the the, the 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 point to make here, okay, so we can come back and note that there was convergence over a long period of the Eurozone south to the north, but then from about two thousand and four, so the the Eurozone begins in, in nineteen ninety nine with decisions being taken and everyone knew it was going to happen in from nineteen ninety five. So then there's a period of very sharp um, divergence that, that we can see. So the, the, the uh, Eurozone crisis from 2010 is one way of thinking about uh, the, the, the divergence that happened. So the, the red and the black, the red and black are, are, the, are the crisis hit countries. These data are from 15, uh, the November 2011. So the black ones are the, were, were the ones at that stage that had already been bailed out. The red ones were with bor a very high borrowing rates and, and, and so on. So the, the south-north divide it emerges very clearly when we, when we see the character of the, of the Eurozone crisis. Okay, so the blue, all these blue ones up here are the north. With, uh, with no risk premium, essentially. Okay, so we're, we're, how, how am I going to try and um, draw some insights from these three, three different cases? The Italian case uh, is a case of political unification from 1861. We, we observed this um, divergence apart from a very uh, short period. 
the German case, political integration from 1871, common economic performance, as far as the data allow us to see it, until the divergence when a completely different set of economic institutions and formal rules were imposed with the introduction of planning in the late 1940s and a period of otaki, and then followed by integration and some but not full convergence. And then the Eurozone crisis with North-South divergence em emerging very sharply in the first decade of monetary integration. So let me just fill in a little bit of the background and, and provide some, some context for, the, for each case. Uh, the the uh, period of uh, where, where the, there was some convergence appears to have been related to a major investment effort by the state. So this is the notion of policy intervention playing some role in shifting the, the south out of a low productivity equity. The policy was then reversed very quickly. So it, it, somehow the policy regime managed to increase investment very sharply, but it was then reversed, and you got back to that picture of, that we saw of, of, of just about 50% of the center north level. The, as a consequence, and this is going to, this turns out to be important in thinking about why should we care about regional diversions within a country, the, the south remains heavily dependent on transfers, and it, it, the estimates, if you, if you look at it, suggest that there's about 20% of GDP being transferred from the center north to the, to the south for every year over a very long period of time. So the questions that arise here are, what, what are the weak institutions? Okay, if I'm going to make a case that somehow this, this, this can, can be related to weak institutions, what are they and why do they persist? Why did the big push policy effort of the 60s not take root and produce sustained catch-up? The background to the German case is um, political and monetary integration from 1871. As I said, the, these areas appeared very comparable um, in, in the period before the Second World War. The separate administrative zones were created in 1945 and uh, there was separate development until reunification. So the, the Formal rules of the game were, were changed dramatically with the introduction of central planning. Um, and what we see in some other work that I've done is that East Germany fits a, a very general pattern, which, which is that the countries that got planning, so if we compare countries that got planning with all the countries in the world, then they basically fall into two buckets. The ones that were relatively rich and this applies to both ways of getting planning, both the first wave um, uh, in, in around 1917 and then the second wave after the Second World War. If you were relatively rich among all the countries in the world when you got planning, then you did worse than your market peers as a consequence of that, of that regime. If, on the other hand, you were relatively poor when, you, when the planning rules were imposed, then you did better than your market economy. And there, there are obvious explanations for that that if we can come back to and talk about it, it's a, that's a different, different subject. The East German case fits very clearly into the case of a relatively rich country that got planning and did worse. So East Germany was once a successful, sophisticated industrial region. The question is why has it not converged to West German levels in spite of massive policy intervention? and the adoption of a set of common formal institutions. Okay, so that's the question. Will it become a mezzo giorno like the Italian South? The third case of the Eurozone, obviously a very different situation. This is not a single country. It's, it's a, a, a staged process of integration <coughs> among a group of countries which began by trade integration with the iron and steel community and the European Economic Community in 1957. The, the, the next step was towards a common currency to monetary but not political integration with the formation of the Eurozone and the crisis that emerged from 2010. But the divergence that I showed you 
in the GDP per capita starts in the middle of the 2000s, um, and that's, that's what, what, what I'm really interested in trying to understand. This is uh, an indication of what was happening right from the beginning of the operation of the Eurozone in terms of the divergence of root exchange rates. And uh, just dividing the, the south and the north in exactly the same way, then we have massive real appreciation taking place in the south from the very beginning of the operation of the Eurozone. The north becomes consistently more competitive until we get to the financial crisis. 2008, when we had some, um, some, some reversal. Okay, and you can see the individual countries shown on the right. Just to illustrate things, I'm going to focus on in the eurozone context, in a sense, on the Germany-Italy comparison. So I've just put the, the real exchange rate. How do you measure the real exchange rate? So th this is uh, um, a relative unit labor cost based measure, but it, it doesn't mat matter whether you measure it through a, a price or a cost based indicator. And there are European Commission, IMF, the series are slightly different, but you get exactly the same picture of this very dramatic and, and persistent <coughs> divergence of, uh, of real exchange rates. So France is excluded from the north? Sorry? Yeah, so in, in, in the north, France is not included, but I just wanted to show you that basically nothing happened to the French real exchange rate in this period, which explains why you put France in here, you don't get things. France looks like the average, if you like, of the, of the Eurozone in terms of its real exchange rate behavior. Okay. So just to, to refresh your your minds about the divergence picture in the Eurozone, the divergence in GDP per capita starts from about the mid-2000s, but we can see that something is going on right from the very beginning. Uh, so the question, what is, if, 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 if I'm going to try and uh, establish this theme, that somehow uh, institutions are not feckless, fecklessness on the part of governments is at the heart of the Eurozone crisis, then uh, what, are, what are these institutions? And can we, can we show a link between uh, what, what's happening here in the European context and what I, what I want to argue in terms of the Italian case and the German case? Okay, so I'm gonna try and link these three things together. And just to, as a reminder of uh, what, what happens when we move in, into a common currency area, so, Whatever macroeconomic shocks there are to inflation, negative demand, supply, or external trade, then what, what's required in an open economy is the adjustment to the exchange rate, and that obviously makes a difference once you're in, a, in the context of monetary integration. Okay, so that if you lose the adjustment path through the nominal exchange rate, then you're you have to rely on adjustment through wages and or productivity. And that's already, if you like, signaling that somehow we might be moving towards a story that uh, brings the labor market into focus, and in particular, in the employment relationship. Okay. So th this is just a collection of the, the questions. Uh, the three cases are, in some sense, very different. And my job is to try and convince you that there's a thread connecting connecting. Okay, so how can we make an argument that this, the difference between the north and the south of, of Italy, possibly the difference between the east and west of Germany, the difference between the south and the north of the Eurozone, that there's some kind of long-run, persistent cultural difference that can endure in the context of economic integration. That's, that's, the, that's the key idea. Now, there are a whole number of, or there are three different ways you might think about this, that somehow there's cultural transmission of these, these attributes over generations. You could take the view that, that the institutions in the different parts of the country, and this obviously um, is, is somehow appropriate if you're thinking about the planning period in Germany are the a result of the imposition of the power. 
Or we can talk about a bottom-up process based on strategic complementarity, and I'm going to pursue the, the third argument. So what, what would the asimoglu robinson argument focus on? Then their argument would be that institutions, so they would say, sure, we might be able to have an institutional explanation of why these patterns persist over very long periods of time, but the emphasis that they would place would be on the role of elite power along these kinds of lines, that investors and innovators must have credible reasons to think that if they're successful, they're not going to be plundered by the powerful, which requires order and inclusive institutions. What I think is interesting about the three cases that, that I want to talk about is that the weak institutions that, uh, that, that seem to be playing a role uh, in, in un, uh, that lie, lie behind the, these persistent gaps are not the weak institutions in the Asimoglu Robinson sense. I want to shift the focus to much more bottom up mechanisms of institutional difference and weakness. And one thing that that does, I think, is that it helps to underline the limits to policy or more broadly to the intervention of competent and inclusive states in doing something about this problem. So in some sense, there's a pessimistic tone to the, the interpretation of it. When you say they, they don't appear to be weak institutions in the Asimoglu sense, mm -hmm. um, you just mean that in, in sort of the, the new Eurozone countries, their, their primary fear isn't necessarily plunder or expropriation. Yes, yes. Okay. yes exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll explain more carefully. More Clearly, what I do mean, just just in one minute, uh, Suresh. Yeah, I would, I would just like qualify this a bit. I, I, I think it's more that they would think that it's like that there's, you know, barriers to entry rather than necessarily mm -hmm. yep. appropriation yeah. by yeah. Uh, okay. uh, by investment. Yeah, and I mean, uh, but that's again going to be a very different mechanism. To I work. agree, but I think the one one thing that's also sort of kind of in the background in their book is the thing that before you have institutions, you need to have like some sort of political centralization. Mm -hmm. And that that, in fact, is kind of maybe part of the this failure of integration, is that you don't have harmonized policy making spaces across these. Um, yeah, that's an alternative hypothesis. And we'll come back to that, because I think that that's also related to this question of, of what, what we think can be done about it in some sense. OK, and it, it, it shows up in each of the cases. Okay, so this is this is the kind of um, the intermezzo section where the idea is to try and provide some kind of analytical framework to to organise our thoughts about the, the, the three cases and these kind of big macro features that, that I've sketched. So this uh, relies on recent work that um, Mariana Belloc and Sam ha have been doing, um, and and. These three points essentially summarize the argument. Um, and I'm going to give you a flavor of, of how, they, how they do the modeling. So th the idea is that you're going to have an integrated economic area that the, the two regions or the two countries are going to be identical in all respects other than these two interacting dimensions. Okay, One to do with institutions, which is going to be to do with, with rules or the, the form of contract that's implemented. And one, and the other is to do with the response, which is going to be the, beha the behavior. And we're going to be focusing on the employment relationship. So all the, 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 the uh, uh, connection to uh, real exchange rates and so on will become more apparent when we set this up. OK, so deeper integrations can raise, can raise the cost of exiting because you get gains from trade. Okay, so that you're put into an economic area and you benefit from that, which makes it more costly for you to try out the higher productivity convention. And let's see, yeah, so th this is going to uh, operate through trade specialization, and there are going to be two kinds of goods, an opaque good and a transparent good. And the opaque good is going to be the one that requires the uh, particular characteristics of this relationship between the rules and the behavior. So you're only going to be able to produce the, the 
media paid for it under certain institutional conditions. Otherwise, you produce the transparent group with all the saver. The, the, the idea of routineness can be, uh, can be implemented empirically using the, the work of um, David Autor and, and co-authors when they look at occupations and classify occupations according to the kind of activities, the kind of decision making that workers have to engage in. And we can correlate these things across countries. So this is the industry characteristic, which is the routineness of the, of, of the activity, and the country characteristic, which is some measure of trust. And you can see that there is a, there is a correlation with countries where higher trust is measured, um, engaging or having a comparative advantage in the opaque group. Okay, so that's, that's the, the kind of empirical motivation for thinking about comparative advantage or specialization based on uh, these, these ideas. The, the kind of modeling is, is uh, an evolutionary game theory model and what turns out to be the case is that if the individual, so this is a very bottom up story and I think that's what's interesting is to, is to try and see how using a very different kind of modeling structure from the sort of macro setting that I established at the beginning can pr perhaps provide us with insight into these problems. So that if individuals conforming to the status quo institutions and the cultural norms, if that's their best response, then we can, we can get the space divided up in, into these two parts, the superior and the inferior um, intervention. What do I mean by institutions? The employer chooses the management structure. Of, and uh, to make it very concrete, it's gonna be some kind of works council or co-determination structure, or a top-down hierarchical management arrangement. So what you should keep in mind when, I, when I'm talking about this is the contrast between uh, management or labor relations uh, organization of Volkswagen on the one hand and Fiat on the other. Okay. and think about how that relates to the kind of goods that Volkswagen produces relative to the, the cars that, or vans that it produces. <clears throat> so the worker response, this is the institution, this is the, this is the cultural norm, if you like, of either cooperating with management or resisting. So this is Volkswagen and Fiat. The firm chooses a management contract, the worker responds, and we get these two conventions. The Volkswagen Convention with a cooperative arrangement, the, the employer uh, allows scope for workers to engage in activities that don't require close supervision. That's the, that's the first convention. The second is the, the very classic top-down management structure where, which will elicit the response of, of oppositional um, behavior on the part of workers. Okay, so the superior convention is Volkswagen's, the inferior convention is Fiat's. The first one is able to produce the opaque good and the second one can only produce the um, transparent good. And this is what happened in the, the, the this is the fate of uh, car production in Germany, Italy from 2000 to 2012, okay, just for light relief, but it shows you that Germany increased its share of, of car production in Western Europe by 15%, from 30% to 44%, and Italy fell from 10% to 5%. So there's a really dramatic reorganization of car production during the period of the Eurozone between the north and the south. Okay, so under conditions of monetary inter uh, integration. So Volkswagen's operating profits uh, dramatically increased and Fiat was really struggling. So this is just, yeah. Well, can you tell me what you would expect from the real exchange rate? Yeah, yeah exactly. So we're going to come to that. So what is it that allowed the real exchange rate? So the real exchange rate changes are endogenous 
to exactly this kind of behavior. That's, that's precisely the link that I want to draw. So it's not as though we have these kind of macro things going on and there's no connection. Can I just ask? Yeah. But isn't it 2,000 periods kind of an anomaly for <coughs> Germany? Because the German workers were made basically massively squeezed in terms of their wage bill only because they were happy to take um, wage cuts because of the long kind of unemployment um, period in the 90s and because of the change in reunification and all yeah. of that. They would have never kind of said yes to that in the 70s, for example. Yeah, and that, you're, you're right, but that's exactly going to be my argument. Okay. In other words, given the external constraints, then how is it that they were, they were able to organize themselves in such a way that they delivered the real exchange rate outcome that we saw, okay? And the outcome that we see in terms of both uh, country performance in, in the car industry and the company performance. So we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so this is just a, a simple picture um, illustrating the Bella Bold, uh, the basic model. The opaque grid is here and the transparent grid is, is on the horizontal axis. The, the whole point is that the north has absolute advantage in producing both goods. So this line is outside the one for the south, but it has comparative advantage in producing the, the opaque good. Okay? What that means, of course, is that these two regions, so whether it's the south and the north of Italy or the south and the north of Europe, they can benefit from, from integration. They can both move on to a uh, on, onto a, a superior uh, output space as a result of um, uh, specialization. So if, if, you set, if you set the model up <coughs> so that the, the regions are of the right size, you'll actually predict complete specialization so that the, the north will only produce the opaque good and the south will only produce the transparent good. Okay? Uh, so the, the point to, to emphasize is that there's no difference. There are no standard endowment, factor endowment differences between these regions, like in the model or between the countries. So the only difference is in the institutional culture convention, right? And that's, that, in other words, it's, it's the, the crucial difference is the one that allows only one of the regions to produce the opaque good. And you can only produce the opaque good if you can combine this rule or instituting from the relocation. Yeah, so it's got to be something to do with location, right? So, and that's, that's an interesting question about why companies get stuck. Of course, we have seen relocation of companies and the, uh, especially for, in, in the car industry to Eastern Europe in, during this period. So I, the, the story I'm telling is not, is not gonna directly bear on, in some sense, why companies get stranded, but it's, it's explaining, or it, it seeks to explain more why countries or regions get left behind. Okay, but it's a very interesting question, right? Because there appear to be, um, it, 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 you, you, if you looked at these differences in, in changes in profits and you look at actually the profitability data, then you would ask exactly your question. <clears throat> okay. So what are the conclusions of the model? The, this diversity produces the basis for specialization in trade. The comparative advantage matches the institutional convention, right? So you can only produce the opaque good if you're in that top left-hand cell, otherwise you produce the transparent one. But the integration produces that specialization, in the extreme case, the complete specialization. Everyone benefits from that, so there are gains from trade, and therefore you have something to lose if you try to experiment, if you like, with the higher productivity convention. <clears throat> okay, so let, let, let me go back then from the, the macro story. We now have some kind of mechanism and then see whether we can find some uh, suggestive evidence.
agency, if you like, as to what, as to the existence of different institutional arrangements, and that will come to your, back to your question as well, um, in the three cases, including the Eurozone. Okay, so w what evidence do we have about the Italian case? So Robert Putnam's work is, is very well known, and he, he documents this uh, very clear difference of what he calls social capital in the North and the South. The, the centre North being characterised by this dense network of local associations. It's, people kind of joke about bird watching, membership of bird watching um, clubs, for example. By active engagement in community affairs, egalitarian pa patterns of politics, by trust and law abidingness. In the South, political and social participation are organised vertically, not horizontally. Mutual suspicion and corruption are regarded as normal. Lawlessness is expected. So there seems, you know, if you just think back to that big long time series where there was there there, there appeared to be a unified economic area in terms of measured GDP per capita at unification. So what happened in the Italian case, and I don't think this has been um, definitively uh, explored, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question, but one might think, if you think about the timing, that industrialization was complementary to northern but not to southern institutions. So that it's an interaction between existing differences in institutions which didn't show up in GDP per capita at the time of unification, that emerged subsequently through the period of industrialization. And the Greif Tabellini work comparing China and, and Europe is maybe insightful in, in giving hints about the origins of this. So their comparison between China and Europe focuses on the fact that clans are kinship based and hierarchical, comparing that with cities. So this is the Chinese case, this is the European case. Cities are based on cooperation with strangers. <coughs> And that allows self-government and urbanization to, to flourish. They also make the point, kind of in passing, but it's interesting when we think about the Italian, uh, the Italian case, that large kinship, kinship groups remained in about the year 1000 only on Europe's social and geographical margins. Okay? Name one example of which is Southern Italy. Right? So their comparison, if you like, is is Northern Europe versus China, but if we take those ideas to Italy, then we, um, we can think about the South. What about the German case? The East had the same formal institutions and norms prior to separate, se separation, and the crucial difference between Italy and Germany is that 19th century, when industrialization took place, it occurred in both Eastern and Western Germany. So there was not this regional or geographical difference within Germany that was characteristic of Italy. Communism imposed different formal institutions and norms, we know that. Uh, it's interesting that we're now getting uh, empirical evidence about the, the persistence of the norms from the communist period in, in the German economy. So that pre-existing institutions and norms were destroyed, but it, 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 it's the case that in districts where there's more surveillance under the East German regime, there's lower measured social capital and trust using very similar kinds of measures to Putnam's measures in the Italian example in the mid 2000s. So what happened in the communist era in terms of altering social capital persists through, uh, it's measurable at least, um, in the 2000s. The, the other thing that happened, and this partly relates, comes, comes to the car industry example, is that so the, the East and West Germany were very similar until planning. Something very different happened in East Germany, but something also happened in West Germany in this period. And that may affect the long-term prospects for convergence. So the institutions behavior convention in the West evolved from the 1980s <clears throat> and uh, what happened was that from the, from, even from the 1980s, under the pressure of, of uh, global competition, so there was like the first round of what you were talking about, um, 
movement was the emergence of a much more complex matrix of strategic complementarities between institutions. So we're not just talking about industrial relations, but we're talking about the, uh, the way the training system works, the financing of industry, and the relations between suppliers uh, and, and uh, end producers all became much more highly integrated and dependent on trust relationships than they had been under standard uh, forms of production, say in the car industry, up to that period. Those more standardized, or what were often referred to as Fordist organization of production, tended to persist in, for example, in Fiat, but they'd been replaced in Volkswagen through this, uh, these changes in the 1980s. Unification in 1990, we get the, re the re-establishment of market rules. Common formal institutions are imposed across the country. There's full unification of labor markets, transfer of union, union bargaining, and of all uh, uh, social security laws and administration. What was the economy like? What was that East German economy like when it was unified? Well, productivity in industry was of less than 30% of West Germany's. And what followed was a massive uh, reduction in the, the tradable sector in East Germany. So the employment in manufacturing and mining fell from 3 million in 1990 to 3 quarters of a million in 1993. All right, so here we have 1990. East Germany's external balance was about 50% deficit. Okay, so it had an external deficit of 50% of its GDP and it had unit labor costs about 40% above West Germany's. Over the period subsequently then uh, East Germany became much more competitive so about 1999 its costs fell below those in West Germany and through the whole period the deficit shrunk to around 10% before the crisis. Okay so there's a very dramatic change in, in uh, competitiveness of East Germany and the recovery, if you like, in, in the in external balance. So why did East Germany not become a mezzo giorno? I think that's, um, that's a very interesting question, uh, placed in the context of, of, of this kind of institutional setting. Convergence is incomplete, but it, does not, it doesn't look as though East Germany will languish at, at this low level relative to the rest of the country, um, as, as it happened in the Italian case. Of course, it may only ever achieve 80% of GDP per capita of, of the West. So the question that arises is, in some sense, how persistent are the long historical conventions given that this was a unified country from the 19th century until 1947, how easy is it to adopt the post-1980s West German conventions with which the East, East Germans, as it were, had no experience? And what, what's the role of, potential role of policy in escaping the collective convention? So that's the picture we saw before. And it's this comparison between the Italian case, the regional variation within Italy and Germany that uh, I think is one way of focusing on the role of the institutions and conventions. This gives you some, um, again, a, a, a useful comparison. Just taking the period from 1990, East Germany relative relative to West, West Germany becomes much, much more competitive. So just starting with, with, uh, with 100 in 1990 or 1991. Okay, I've, I've already shown you those data for East Germany. Look through this period and you can see that nothing happens in the Italian case. So the mezzo giorno just remains relentlessly, if you like, uncompetitive relative to uh, the sentinel of the country which is very consistent with that very uh, uh, constant <coughs> <level. coughs> that. 
this is another way of looking at the same picture, which focuses on the tradable sector and says one dimension of regional dependence is captured by the strength of tradable, which is what I was referring to both in, in terms of the transfers from the centre of North of Italy to the south, but also in the external balance. So here, Germany has a complete, East Germany has a complete collapse of its tradable sector, and then you get some slow recovery. In the mezzogiorno, the tradable, employment in the tradable sector shrinks continuously throughout this period. So the tradable sector is mining, manufacturing, tourism, and an estimate of the tradables component of the financial sector. And not fun. Yeah, fun. What can we learn from this comparison about, from somehow from about the historical persistence of institutions? In terms of cities, strangers, and trust, Italy and Germany look very different. In Italy, there were free city states in the north and absolutist regimes in the south. Okay, so this difference in Italy is just wherever you look for it, you find it over, over a very long historical period. Germany was completely different. There were free and imperial cities in both the West and the East. There were Hanseatic cities in both the West and the East. No regional differentiation. In terms of human capital, you see something very similar. Right? In, in the Italian case, by 1500, there were 12 universities in the north, three in the south. By 1500 in Germany, seven in the larger west, five in the east. In terms of industrialization, I think this is, this is particularly uh, salient. In 1911, the share of employment in industry was 21% in the north, 15% in the south. Industrialization in Germany was actually led by the east, by Saxony, where the share of employment in industry was 20% and 35% in the East. What about contemporary indicators of trust? In terms of voluntary work, in the South, the incidence is 53% of that of the North in 1997, pretty similar uh, in the second survey in 2002. Higher again, in, in East Germany, okay? It's not as high as in the West, but it's higher relatively than it is in the Italian case. We see the same gap if we look at the shadow economy. 25% of GDP in the South, 19% in the Centre North. They're lower and there's much, a much smaller gap in, in the German case. So who, who makes more organ donations? This is interesting. There's more organ donations made in Italy than there is in Germany, but there's a big difference between the south and the north of Italy. There's, there's more organ donations from East Germany, uh, uh, but the difference is much smaller. In terms of interventional policy, I pointed towards, and there's some evidence which I didn't report, but comes from earlier research, about the role of investment in driving convergence. In the one period we see it in Italy, in the uh, from, from, about 19, uh, from about 1960 to 75. There's been massive policy intervention in East Germany. That This is the ratio of investment in machinery and, and equipment in the East relative to the West. So this was the massive intervention by West Germany in the first phase of, uh, of unification, but you can see that the, there's the, a positive gap remains even um, up to the latest data. And this is not the case in, in Italy. And if anything, towards the end of the period, um, the, the share of investment falls in the south relative to the rest of the country. Let me turn to the final case, the Eurozone case, and which I think is, is interesting because it kind of collects together the, the insights from the Italian case and the German case within the context of monetary union. 
And the argument that I, I would like to make is that understanding how monetary union operates requires understanding of the rules of the game at a decentralized level by firms and by workers. So that, that, that's really the claim. That the idea that you had to be able to deliver the appropriate real exchange rate to retain competitiveness under conditions of monetary union couldn't be delivered through the nominal exchange rate. So how's it going to be done? It has to be done, if you like, through internal devaluation or internal adjustments of relative costs. And the argument is that the ability to do that depends crucially on the character of institutions and of the institutions that I've, that I've pointed to. So adversarial industrial relations and the absence of trust and a shared understanding of what these new rules of the game meant in the mon in, in monetary union prevented this in the South. Of course, if you're using a standard macro model, so any, any kind of new Keynesian uh, model, for example, then it simply ignores in the institutions and assumes that as soon as you change the rules of the game, then there'll be immediate adjustment uh, by all parties and you just jump onto the appropriate path that will take you to the correct real exchange rate in the face of any shock. Okay, so this is just automatic in standard models. This is the picture we've seen before. This breaks it down into, the, into uh, wages and productivity. And I think, again, shows very strikingly what, what happened right from the beginning of the Eurozone. So the red is uh, wages per worker. So wages per worker in the South increased much more rapidly than they did in the North. But equally, it was the case uh, that productivity in the North rose much more rapidly in the South. So you put them together and you get that massive real exchange rate divergence. You know what you would see if you could just decompose the Italian series into North and South? Uh, I mean, your model would predict that they would show very different real exchange rates, right? Yes. Have you, have you looked at that? Yeah, no. But, uh, well, not, 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 um, not, not expressed exactly in the same form, but yes, you get exactly, you, you get the same picture. So, uh, I haven't I haven't got it here, but yeah, so if you you can do exactly the same thing. You can look at productivity developments and and uh, nominal wage differences at a regional level right. and split out split them out in the same way, and you 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 get exactly the same decline in competitiveness in the Italian case, with the one exception of the period from uh, it, it, between the, the south and the north of Italy with the exception of the period between 60 and 75, where the real exchange rate improves in favor of... But I mean, over this period, 1990 yeah. 2001, yeah. if you, if you, if you plot it the exact same thing by region within yeah. Italy, you get the same kind of divergence. Uh, uh, well, actually, for, for this period, um, we have that, I think. For this period, um, the, 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 the real exchange rate of the South, it, 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 there's no very clear trend during this period. There is a clear trend in the German case where East, East Germany becomes even more competitive relative to West Germany in this, in this period. And Germany becomes more competitive relative to Italy. Within Italy, in this period, mm -hmm. there's very little difference. Between really North and South. Yeah. yeah, so the, the internal real exchange rate doesn't move very much in the Italian case. In the intra <coughs> The argument that you're making about the differences in trust in institutions between North and South. Yeah, so what, I guess, I guess the, 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 the Italian argument is, is a very long run argument, which, which suggests that, <coughs> so that there, are, there are two things going on in this period. Okay? One is that very little is happening in either, I think, in changes in trust if within across regions within Italy, and similarly with changes in the real exchange rate within Italy in this period, okay? But over the very long period, then we see this pattern being reflected. So if you remember, the, the picture kind of really flattens out uh, 
over the, over the, the period of the 2000s in, in, in terms of the, the rate of exchange rate with industry. So if you like, you don't have evidence that the differences in trust are causing, are causing a, worse, a, a relative worsening. I think that's your point yeah. over this period. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it, in, the, in, the, in the German case, you see that you see the, if you like, the argument that there was an improvement in the convention in the East over this period being reflected in the catch-up of the East to West Germany. Yeah. Like in the sense that um, <coughs> in the South, in the nominal wages for worker are going up in relation to the North. Um, is that perhaps because of rising class levels in the South? Um, and that's yeah, no, in, actually in this period, 1999 to 2011, um, what, what's really going on, I think the real changes that are going on are changes in the norm. So it's, it's the responsiveness of, of employers and workers together responding to the new rules of the game which allows for this moderation in wage growth in, in the North relative to the South. So in, in that sense, uh, I think, in, at least in the, in the tradable sector, and I'm going to come and show you something at the end that bears directly on this. Okay? So that we, we yeah. Can we just hold that until, yeah. until I show you at the, at the end? Um, but couldn't you also say that um, German firms actually um, abused the rule of the game because on the European level there was a 3% inflation target and they consistently were be, um, below that kind of, yeah, going into almost dumping the wages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. <coughs> what do we mean by the rules of the game of a monetary union? And what does it mean to stick to those rules of the game? Mm -hmm. Well, from a national self-interested point of view, then abiding by the rules of the game of, a, of monetary union require you to deliver the appropriate real exchange rate. Okay? And that's exactly what they did. Right? The consequences of that for the stability of the, uh, the monetary, uh, the common currency area as a whole, um, and we've, we've seen the consequences of that. And German workers and uh, German citizens mm. are born. Yeah, but I mean, like at cost. the European level, there was actually a binding rule to kind of have three percent inflation. No, there was no, didn't. no, no. That's I think that's a very deep misunderstanding. The the rule was for the ECB to hit an inflation target <coughs> of just below two percent, which it did brilliantly. So the ECB exactly got inflation on target. It was actually slightly above two percent, but they basically did it. How did they do it? Because the, the weight of German inflation, which was well below target, and Germany is a sufficiently, uh, sufficiently large country, along with the little ones, Finland and so on, that were behaving in exactly the same way, to outweigh the much higher inflation in the southern periphery. Okay? So the, I think it highlights the fact that the, the, the monetary authority can achieve successful inflation targeting whilst harboring growing and unsustainable imbalances mm. inside. <clears throat> is this, is it always the case, I mean you might ask the question, is it always the case that the South becomes uncompetitive relative to the North? And the answer of course is absolutely not. So if you look at the period 1955 to 1967, then you see that although nominal wages grew somewhat faster in the South than the North, this was the era of rapid productivity catch-up in the South, so that, uh, in, in, in fact, the South became, um, became more competitive relative to the North over this period. <coughs> okay, well, I think we can do this. So what this really comes down to is the differences in wage and price value institutions across members. Reduced diverging real exchange rates and potential instability. Why does this happen? Because wage setting in Germany basically takes place as a variant of the Scandinavian model, where the unions and employers 
understand the model and they're able to agree on nominal wage increases that are consistent with keeping competitive, retaining competitiveness and the required profit margins. From the late 1990s, this was augmented and this turns out to be very crucial in the context of, of, of monetary integration. This was happening at the much more decentralized level, so it fits this idea of, of the institution's behavior convention very well, I think. If you look at what was happening within companies, there were these very flexible deals being uh, agreed to over wages, hours of work, training, and investment. So it was both deals about wages and about productivity and about conditions that allowed the real exchange rate to be targeted. The, the last thing I wanted to do was to move from talking very much in this direction, which is the convention producing specialization, and, and to, to try and think about whether there's any evidence of once these, when these two conventions are in place, how does the integration process feed back into reinforcing the, the convention? And here, uh, what, what's very interesting shows up again in the Eurozone case, where what we saw under conditions of monetary integration is not a convergence of government standards or of institutional policy between the South and the North of the Eurozone, but exactly the opposite. So again, the blue, the blue is the, the North, the red is the South, Looking from the beginning, 1998 to about 2010, you can see that in virtually every case, the gap, whether it's the measure of the rule of law, the control of co corruption, regulatory po policy or government effectiveness, the gap between the North and the South widens. So monetary integration allowed for, if you like, uh, by encouraging activities that were complementary to the institution's culture convention that prevailed, fed back to weakening the policy of institutions. And this is just showing the same uh, picture across all the countries, one of the indicators, the rule of law indicator. Okay, so we just see this, this widening out of, uh, of the gap. So, so let me just um, finish by drawing together some common themes from the case studies. It's, it, it seems that we can make some progress by thinking not only about formal rules of the game, such as planning or the rules of the common currency area, but also by thinking about informal norms and behavior. But, Integration has this effect of cementing, you know, by precisely by providing opportunities of gain of the gains from trade, of cementing the behaviour in the two different regions or the two different countries. But inter integration facilitates intertemporal smoothing, but it permits long-term de dependence, and it doesn't necessarily promote convergence. So this permits long-term convergence comes comes back to the question that, that someone raised about the, the, in a sense, the difference between the interregional case and the monetary union case. So in the interregional case, there's, there's there are mechanisms that will allow the, the richer region to continuously provide support to the poorer region. In the Eurozone, the absence of those institutions is one way of thinking about the emergence of the sovereign debt crisis. Okay, so the difference between the, the within country version of this, uh, of, of the divergence problem and the, the version of the within a monetary union. And throughout the, the story, the, what, what's become very clear, I think, is the importance of the trade oil sector. So integration doesn't, doesn't necessarily ensure the convergence of the South, of the weak region. If there are different institutions, cultural conventions, this integration can just allow those things to persist. Policy can shift the weak region 
towards convergence, but it will only last if the North Convention is adopted. And if you like, this is a pretty pessimistic conclusion. It's a, it's a pessimistic conclusion about Italy, and it raises the question of what is it that has bound the Italian polity together? Right? Why, why haven't they just dumped the Mezzo Giorno long ago? And that, that obviously relates to, to, to the characteristics of the nation and the willingness to continuously supply um, transfers to the weak region. But that long-term dependence has, has also, uh, if you like, um, allowed the, the, these two conventions to, to persist. The one attempt, the serious attempt that, that there was using policy made some difference, but it, had, it appears to have had no, had, had no run, run effect. The German case, I think, is pretty interesting, but we need to do a lot more detailed historical research because it's really asking the question of you have an integrated ec economic area, you then separate it completely for 40 years, you then reintegrate it. And the question is, in some sense, what's the relative role of the persistence of what happened before the period of separation as compared, as compared with what happened in each of the parts during separation? So, for the, the question of persistence thereafter. Okay, and somehow, if we're going to answer the question of whether East Germany will be a new mezzo giorno, okay, I've tried to give you a kind of optimistic spin, at least relative to, to Italy, then these are the, the kinds of questions we need to understand. And then the third case, the Eurozone, is, in my view, a very pessimistic <laughs> conclusion. Um, because you neither, in some sense, have the political institutions to support long-term, either long-term dependence through, through transfers or to, to initiate really serious policy intervention that might shift the convention in the South. Unless the North shifts its convention to us. <laughs> well, that's a, there you are. That's, a, that's an idea. <laughs> Right, okay, so then let me stop. So, so I, I think this is interesting, but it's, it's also like this is just another microcosm of it. I think, like, you know, you've got dependency theory sort of all over again, just within Europe then rather than between Europe, you know, between first world and third. So that, you know, this idea that globalization and, and integration could get you, you know, divergence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 no, I think it's a much more general. But I don't think people have particularly thought about it in, in the context of these, of these I and mean, I think no one really thought of you or uh, <laughs> within Europe dependency theory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then it's just there's actually like an interesting. I mean, just because I think of the U.S. history and the, mm -hmm. similar the, the, the Constitution being a, a device that ties together these colonies that kind of hate each other. Yeah. Um, and uh, into into a common policy framework, and uh, uh, and then really you only start getting convergence between South and North after the New Deal. So when you actually get these converge, when you actually get the sort of massive fiscal transfers going yeah. and sort mm -hmm. of uh, sustained. So so I don't. I guess I wonder why you're pessimistic about fiscal union. Um. Well, if if I was if I was optimistic about fiscal union, then it might be a different story. Okay. Yeah, so do we not think that it's on the political horizon or? Maybe, but you're absolutely right. That's, if you, I think, think about it another way. Do we have a notion of a European citizen? I don't know, I don't live there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that, that's one way of thinking about it. Because you could, you could put the question about why, why, why has Italy been able to sustain these extraordinary uh, transfers over such a long period of time? Well, presumably because people fought in the same wars. That there's, a, there's some kind of no notion of a citizen. Supported the same from Well, yeah. In, the Euro in, in, in Europe, in Eurozone, that, that's entirely absent. And that's not quite true. Sorry? That's not quite true, I would say. It really depends on the country and 
um, it might be, I think one of the problems is maybe that it's like an elite project to some extent, but yes. there are definitely people who think themselves being European. Yeah, no? that's, that, that European? may be the case, what but that's not, really, that's not really the point in terms of whether Europe is, is willing to engage sure. in the kinds of combination of redistributive policies and interventionist policies to try to, uh, to, to really shift um, mm -hmm. the, the, the southern... It, it, there's a lot of talk about kind of liberalisation or whatever, mm -hmm. but that's, that, it, I think a much sharper way of thinking about it is in terms of creating a tradable sector that can sustain the level of GDP per capita that, that is viewed as reasonable. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's the, it's the weakness of the tradable sector um, that comes out of this split between these two conventions that I think is really at the heart of the sustainability of the Eurozone project. Yeah. Um, this might just be my lack of knowledge, but um, in terms of like institutional explanations for the divergence between the North and South and Eurozone in the 2000s, um, you've given us, I mean, that was a lot of insight into at a kind of domestic level and a, an individual and domestic institutional level. Mm -hmm but what caused it. And then there seems to be a kind of the institutional structure of the Eurozone itself as a monetary union, which allowed kind of capital flows and so on and so forth from the North and South, which played their own part. Now, are these two things, are they complementary or are they the same thing just manifesting themselves at a, ma at a micro and a macro level? Yeah, or yes, they, I think they're absolutely complementary. So the, uh, what, what the Eurozone, um, what the mechanism did, and this is gonna come back to of Rajiv's point, um, a, a different manifestation of his point, uh, was, was that the, the interest rate uh, converged immediately. Okay, so there was a single interest rate, so it suddenly became much cheaper to borrow in the South. And what, what the markets failed to do was to differentiate, to, to uh, provide a different risk premium for borrowing in, in these different so it's a, that's a very interesting question about, about why that didn't happen. And so there were huge capital flows from Germany, for example, to the south. And where they were flowing was in, into the non-tradable sector. And the non-tradable sector was, was booming, so that's where the construction booms were, were occurring. The tradable sector was becoming more and more uncompetitive. So that I think the two things are very tightly linked together. In the, within the same phenomenon. So exactly the opposite process was happening in Germany. And looking forward to kind of, looking forward in terms of um, convergence without kind of, with the North kind of unwilling to have inflation say that to the South and with normal wages not really dropping in the South of the Eurozone, like what, what, what is gonna happen moving forward in terms of convergence? Yeah, could, I, could I just follow up on yeah. that a little uh, um, which is, what kind of mechanism, if anyone can think of, it, would have the incentives for the North to make a real exchange rate appreciation? The kind of question that Keynes was concerned with at Bretton Woods, the, the differential incentive in the surplus and deficit yeah, countries yeah. for adjustment. Well, I think Is there a mechanism? No, I, I think that, that by really focusing on the micro level and really understanding the incentives at the level of the firms, then it's very difficult to, so I think it's very important to separate the, the sort of macro policy idea from the micro implementation. And the fact is that the real exchange rate can be implemented at the micro level. And that's why you really have to understand these, uh, you know, these really basic um, relationships uh, among firms and, and workers to see that whatever you did as it were can be undone. And, and that's why I think a lot of the discussion in the Eurozone is very misplaced, because it's as if, if we could just get the real exchange rate right, then everything would be fine. But the fact is, it can just be undone, and it will be undone by German firms and German workers, to the extent that they require a certain real exchange rate to sustain the engineering industry. So that's why I think it, it, you can't just think at the macro level. You have to understand that, that in terms of tradables, the, the action can, can
can well be happening um, if you have the right institutions at the micro level. And that's why, if you don't have those kind of institutions, then having the nominal exchange rate is a very useful instrument because you can achieve those changes in the exchange rate um, through, through inflation targeting, for example. Some similar sort of trying to think about you know, the division of what you said, I think very interesting how some countries manage to maintain or in some sense from the value of the exchange rate in their term, East Asian Oh, sorry. Um, no, I was trying to relate this to this issue of you know how some countries are able to maintain undervalued exchange rate in some sense for long period which is what the East Asian are supposed to have done. That it has to do not just with the, it has to do with some kind of something more than just macroeconomic exactly. policies and trade exchange. Yeah, and I think it's very similar sets of That's a very interesting very interesting uh, um, uh, yeah. are at work in explaining the East Asian case. Right, right, right. Exactly. And so you have these different different sets of countries. I mean I can focus on regions here and within the Eurozone, but you can think of it on, on a global global level as well. You have certain countries where where the focus is on the tradable sector and where those objectives in some sense, or the interests of the firms in the tradable sector, firms and workers in the tradable sector, are, are, are implemented through these decentralized processes. Or well, we're trying to create a set of institutions which allow the real yeah. exchange rate yeah. to remain on the value yeah. for but I think long you, period. Yes, but you've got, to have the right, you've got to have the right institutions at the level of the firm. So the employment relationship, I think, is very central to the, to the behavior in Japan, the East Asian countries, as well as Germany and the Nordic countries. It's not, it, you, it can't be understood simply by the choice of exchange rate regime, which is just another way of saying the choice of macro policy. Oh, you think you're extending your work? Uh, so. Very interesting. Yeah, no, I think, it, I think it's a more general. So, this is a question, I guess, for you and I, I, I suspect a little for Sam, which has got to do with the idea behind this. Uh, somehow in this, it's, the institutions are more durable than, the, than we expect, uh, than, we, uh, than, we, than we consider in making policy. But quite often, it is the case, at least the way that policy makers speak about it, that institutions are much more malleable than that. We, we do it and we have to adjust. I think this, the case is where that is true, and I don't know how to think about that in the general case. Why, why is it not the case that things change? And, you know, yeah. let's say no, I think it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, and it certainly came, came as a great surprise to everyone that you change these rules irrevocably in the monetary union, and yet behavior didn't change at all in terms of wages and, and productivity yields, for example, in a whole set of countries. So this was supposed to be, you know, irrevocable, irreversible. The, the rules had changed for and the institutions and behavior didn't change. So how do we understand that? But it may be a lag effect, right? I mean, since we did at the period, you know, that we're yeah. considering initially, uh, people didn't realize the consequences of not changing the institutions until the crisis hit. And then it's people focus on. But look at how long it's lasted in Italy. <laughs> you could say it's lasted that long in Italy because it's existing within a political framework which allows permanent transfers to happen. And that's why I think the questions about fiscal union and so on are very relevant to this. I think it's, I mean, it's totally fascinating, Wendy. I, I just think that some of the intra country variation that you talked about, yeah. especially within Italy, might cause you to temper your pessimism a bit because you know you might have a, a, a regional adjustments within countries that could uh, you know that could attract industry within those countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know to have the real exchange rate because one of the things that I'm getting out of what you're saying is that real exchange rate is really not determined by countries; it's determined by individual employers and firms. Mm -hmm. And if you've got within country heterogeneity in institutions as you do in Italy, yeah, it could be that you know the, you know northern Italy could be the the uh, uh, the place where the real ex exchange rate adjustment takes place, you know, and you know, given time, attracts enough in industry to make 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 the yeah. The I mean, that's interesting. And, you know, why hasn't it, why hasn't it happened? I mean, parts of Northern Italy are actually rather similar to Germany, for yes. example. Um, 
not, not actually not the car industry, but the small, very specialized engineering sector in the north. Yes, and institutions there work in a very similar way. Um, but, but it kind of begs the question of why, why should that influence at the country level? I mean, why, why is that going to affect anything? In the, in the south, southern part of Italy. Oh, it's, it's just that it's not that it would affect. Oh, you mean you think it more in terms of mobility of resources it's, out of the south? I mean, I mean, if you look at the way that even the German engineering production takes place, it's in a particular, regionally specific areas. Right? It's not diffuse across the entire no. country of Germany. Yeah. So, you know, you know, there seems to be some scope for potential. Uh, sure, and in fact, that's what happened with with the opening up of Eastern Europe. And that was one of the pressures on the German industry, precisely, that suddenly there was this opportunity for producing components, important components in the engineering industry, much more cheaply with very skilled workers in, in the vicinity. And, and, and that happened with, with the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland. It didn't happen with East Germany because the costs were, were way too high. So the, re, the whole re reorientation of the European car industry took place during this period. So you're absolutely right, but I don't think that really speaks to the to the question of the lagging region. Does it? I mean, did, unless all the resources are sucked out of of, of the south. I mean, the south of Italy still has more than thirty percent, uh, so thirty six, thirty seven percent of the population. There's a question there. Uh, what do you see as sort of the line, and maybe there isn't a bright line, but what is the bright line or a line between um, policy and institution in your thinking? Because I mean, you sort of mentioned at the outset that you that you don't see in sort of the newer in, in the south of Italy or east of Germany or newer eurozone countries, you don't see sort of the types of you know predatory kind of expropriation type mm -hmm. grabbing um, that you see in some other context, and I mean, I would have to think that, that some of that is the result of sort of policy constraints that are being imposed at sort of either the European or the national, nation state level. I mean, it seems to me that some of those things qualify as institutional shifts. I mean, if, if there's sort of no longer that type of predatory mm -hmm. state activity, that, that that's actually kind of a confirmation of some capacity to, in these instances, to have some institutional shift. Yeah, I think the... the the real question is what can what can policy do to 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 create? I mean, yeah, what's the scope for policy intervention that that will allow you to create institutions in the tradable sector that, that that are competitive? Okay, given given who you're competing with. So how can you move out of that um, that transparent? Low value added specialization. And what can policy do to, to, to shift that? And it's, it's interesting, I think, in the East German case, about to what extent it has it been policy, certainly providing infrastructure, which is very important, providing subsidies for investment, but actually getting that, you know, it's pretty feeble, but that increase in the share of traders employment that you could see steadily taking place in the East German case. I think it's very bottom up and I, I'm not sure it's I'm not sure I could list a set of government interventions that have been important in delivering that. But we don't I think we don't know a lot about that and I think one area of very interesting research is to do extremely detailed work in East Germany, for example, looking at at the extent to which you can literally track the emergence of new enterprises in particular sectors in the in the post transition period with historical instances of, of the same kinds of industries in those same locations um, and there's some kind of anecdotal evidence that that that's that explaining the new industrial structure in East Germany has got those kind of very long roots, but nobody's really demonstrated that can be seen. Can you what? Sorry. Sorry. And, and yeah. 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 Um, by all means, say no, but I'm just wondering. 
wondering if there's any application to the regional disparities in the UK. And I've been trying to kind of fit this together in my mind, and everything seems a bit the wrong way round in terms of kind of the weaker and the stronger regions and the pattern of institutions and our tradable yeah, sector being finance. Spell out your kind Okay, I haven't thought it through properly at all. So my instinct is we have a clear division um, between the North and the South, to put it very crudely. Um, we have a mass, I'm, and here again I will say I'm not a macroeconomist. Um, we have, you know, there's been a massive deindustrialization of the North. Our tradable sector, insofar as anything seems significant, seems to be financial services. Um, it doesn't look to me like the pattern of institutions in our financial services sector is anything like the car industry in Germany. So basically, I'm just confused. No, okay, let me, let me show you one more. Okay, so this is, so I think what you're, what you're talking about is that I've just sketched one variant of a high productivity convention. Okay, you could, you could immediately have come back and said, yeah, what about the US, or it doesn't, it doesn't really sound like this kind of this, uh, intimate relationship between, between the employers and works councils and so on that seems to characterize the engineering industry, which is obviously the heart of the tradable sector. So I think that there's another literature that, that speaks to this. Um, it's a separate but, very, but related literature because it also rests on strategic complementarities. Um, between institutions, so um, very similar ideas come out of uh, this so-called varieties of capitalism literature, um, and it, it tends the way it, it argue focuses on the types of innovation. So the the argument is that there's a what's referred to as a radical innovation convention, which is consistent with liberal market economies like the US or the UK. And a very interesting question about the UK is whether innovation in the financial sector, it's certainly, um, it's certainly radical, and the question is whether it has the capacity to deliver in a long-term sustainable sense. So it's really Anton's point that he, he raised this morning. And then there's an incremental innovation convention, which is the so-called coordinated market economies, of which Germany is the classic case. And, and the the, this picture here is just a very vivid way of thinking that, that, in, that there's not just one high productivity convention, and there, there, there are certainly two very distinct ones. So this is patent specialization for the US and Germany. And industries are listed here, so this is specialization in patenting by industry among 12 countries. And the, the zero line, anything to the right of here is that you patent more than the average of these 12 countries in these industries, and to the left, vice versa. What you see, just comparing Germany and the US, is that their specialization is completely different, right? I haven't told you anything about the nature of these industries, but you can just look that the US is specializing in all these industries at the top in its innovation, and Germany is specializing in all these industries at the bottom. So the question is, what what, what, what are the characteristics of these industries? How are these industries ranked? Can you, can you just take a look at them? It's information technology, biotechnology, semiconductors, macro chemicals and polymers, surface technology, blah, blah. And then it's mechanical elements, consumer goods, transport, agriculture, and food processing machinery. These are really boring. <laughs> these are really exciting the ones at the top. So what's the difference? So the ranking of these industries is the scientific content of patents. So the idea is that in, in, in an integrated global economy, you have a set of economies with very similar levels of per capita GDP. So just the US and Germany as an example, specializing in, in, very, in innovating in very different industries. Okay, so, so the, that's another example of where integration will reinforce the convention and reinforce the institutions that are that, that are complementary to the specialization but it's broadening out the argument from saying 
which I think is what you were kind of getting at, that I was suggesting there was just one kind of convention, and the UK just didn't seem to fit because to the extent there were any there was any car industry, it was in the north rather than the south, etc. <clears throat> but if you think of the UK specialising in in uh, industries more towards the top of this table, pharmaceuticals, for example, then you can begin to think of the institutions that are consistent with that specialisation, and they're very different from the ones in which Germany specialises. And then the, then the kind of next question is whether if, if, if you're trying to shift from a bad convention, say from the, from the southern Italian one, then all the rhetoric in the policy sphere is about liberalisation, which is as if the only convention was actually the US convention. And it's, it's interesting to, to, to kind of put that into the context of how I've been arguing about the, the dominant conventions within the Eurozone itself. And some of the argument about Germany is whether East Germany, the, the East German tradables to the extent it's evolved is, is very different and seems to rest much less on the kinds of um, uh, employment relationships and so on that are, ca are characteristic of West Germany. So it may be moving to some, this other kind of convention, high direction. But is it possible to think also in terms of, you know, different mechanisms of exchange rate adjustment being appropriate for different kinds of contexts, where you have a problem of, you know, yeah. right? so you, that says that we have nominal exchange rate as an instrument for real exchange rate adjustment works better for exactly. these kinds of things. Exactly, yeah. So you could say, and I think it comes back to the question about sort of who, in whose interest was the Eurozone created? and so why, did, why was Germany interested in belonging to the Eurozone? Well, you, at least I mean, its way of thinking about it is because they knew they could operate with those rules. And if you were arguing about whether the UK should join the Eurozone, then the argument would have been, this is a very bad idea. Because given its institutions, then it requires the nominal exchange rate as an adjustment. So the countries that joined, the southern countries that joined, were focused much more on the, the fact that the Eurozone would deliver a low inflation, a credible low inflation macroeconomic environment. And it was simply assumed that private sector behavior would fall into line in terms of real exchange rate adjustments. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming here that the firms don't matter. It's an economic uh, In a sense, uh, there are no firm level differences within a region. Uh, for example, if Volkswagen comes to the south of Italy, yeah. they'll behave as badly as. You know, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's very interesting. Uh, put it the question the other way why won't Volkswagen go to the south of Italy? Hmm. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> But so 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 the so there were so the attempts, if you like, in the of the big policy intervention, sixty to seventy five, were to try to do that, were to literally shift economic activity, incentivize firms very strongly to establish operations in the south. At that time, it was heavy industry, a steel industry, in the, in the south of Italy. Okay, but you don't observe firms choosing to go. Volkswagen or whatever to 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 operate in those areas because okay they if you like they've got the firm you think about a box the firm can establish whatever contract it chooses but if it's not operating in, in if it's not going to have the appropriate um, response in terms of worker behaviour then it won't be able to produce the okay good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. But uh, today the, the uh, inner room is closed off because it's a private lunch, so we'll have to sit outside like we did before.